Um, I'd like to play a little game called Back in My Day. You like that game? This is a back in my day moment, and uh, it happened in the Seattle Living Computer Museum. Highly recommended. If you're ever in Seattle, it's pretty close to Starbucks headquarters, so you can go pick up a latte and, and uh, take a tour through the history of computers. So as I was taking this tour, uh, my first computer happened to be in the museum. Nothing like that to make you feel old than seeing your, your computer in a museum. Can anyone see what it is? A little hard to tell from here. Yeah, it's a Commodore 64, a classic. And if you look closely, there's a, even a floppy disk sitting there. <coughs> and the, the disk drive was enormous. It was a big, clunky thing. The 1541, I can tell. Indeed, that's exactly what it is. So my first security gig was cracking the copy protection on floppy disks so my friends and I could share our games. And it turned into this game of cat and mouse where the game publishers would make you do things like turn to page 42 in the manual and type in this word from the fourth sentence on the page. So our workaround was to go into my dad's office and use the photocopier to copy the manual. This was in the days before they had the rap videos about software piracy. So remember kids, don't copy that floppy. <laughs> we can play some more back in my day at happy hour if you like. I love hearing your DevOps war stories. But these days I'm no longer a sysadmin. Um, I handed in the on-call pager and now I travel and talk to folks like you about security and infrastructure. But before we talk about Vault, let me share a little story with you. This story is called The Boy Who Accidentally Copied His AWS Keys to GitHub. <laughs> also known as How to Turn Your Cloud Account into a Cryptocurrency Farm in Three Easy Steps. <laughs> this is a real game, by the way. You can download it off of Steam. It looks terrible. <laughs> And in case you're curious, the lead role in this story is played by yours truly. So once upon a time, um, there was a solutions engineer who wanted to build a Terraform demo. And our hero needed some code. And what do sysadmins do when they need code? We go to Stack Overflow. And we copy it. So I was going to copy some old code that I had. I had a copy of my Terraform tutorial in another repo. And I dutifully put a .gitignore file in the repo to protect my credentials. So it wasn't the best protection, as I found out. I used my handy cp-r command to make a copy of this repo. And guess which file didn't get copied into the new repository? <laughs> yeah, the one that says ignore the credentials that are sitting here in the same folder. You can probably see where this is going. So that single hidden git ignore file was the only thing protecting the credentials, and now it was gone. Um, the safety switch on the foot gun was essentially set to off. So the stage was set. You can probably guess what happened next. Git add. Git commit. Git push. Hey, how come I can't log on to the AWS console anymore? Let's check something here. Oh my gosh, the API isn't working either. Let me hop on Slack. Hey, oh wait, no one else can get into our account either? <laughs> <laughs> so that sinking feeling sets in, and I'll spare you the details, but the short version is that a bot had picked up those credentials, and within two minutes, two minutes, repurposed the entire AWS account into a massive cryptocurrency farm. Actually, I wasn't even mad, because it was so amazing. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing the attacker did was create themselves a new admin account with a very generic looking name. Next, they disabled all the other admin accounts to lock everyone else out. And then they systematically begin spinning up the maximum number of EC2 instances of each size in every single region. <laughs> oh 
And the icing on the cake was every single one of those instances had the termination protection switch flip to on. <laughs> yeah, it was bad. So fortunately, our security and operations folks were able to quickly close access to the account. We shut down all the instances, but not before they'd managed to run up a $20,000 bill in less than an hour. Yeah. So yeah, that's a, that was one of my whoppers. I've got some others I can tell you about it at happy hour. That's why they don't let me touch production anymore. <laughs> um, but the point is, Cloud API credentials are powerful. If your cloud account were a data center, um, these admin level API keys are like a skeleton key. It can open the front door, it can open the inner door, it can open every single server cabinet, the back little key on every server you can open up. You can even use this magic key to order more servers, right? As many as you need. The cloud provider's like, okay, sure. You want 500 Super XL instances in Japan? We got it. So now every time I see AWS keys in plain text, I have a mini panic attack. Like I get a little, you know, the heebie-jeebies when I see those keys sitting there. And it turns out I'm not alone. Um, thousands of API keys are accidentally pushed to GitHub every single day. So how can we better manage these credentials and reduce the amount of risk in our cloud environments? One way to manage your API credentials is with HashiCorp Vault. So a little disclaimer, I do work at HashiCorp, but everything you see in this presentation today is gonna be uh, done with open source software. So you don't have to pay for any of this. What is Vault? It's an API driven cloud agnostic secrets management system. So it's more than just a password vault, though you certainly can store passwords in it. But it can do other things like generate short-lived credentials that expire after a certain amount of time. So you can use this with things like your cloud APIs, um, your databases. How many of you are using Vault today? Quick show of hands. OK, good. For the rest of everybody, um, I'd like to just give a quick overview and explanation of Vault and what it is, how it works. And then we'll get into the demo. This is the traditional security model, also known as the castle and moat approach. Kind of like a data center, right? Big, heavy building, four walls, kind of, you know, highly controlled ingress and egress points, hard on the outside and squishy and soft on the inside. And this worked pretty well for decades. For some of us, it's still the way we do things today. A lot of compute is still done inside our own data centers. Um, but the problem is these traditional security models were built upon the idea of perimeter-based security, where you, you, know, you have strict control over who can come in and out of that building. You've got to have a badge to get in. You need maybe a VPN you know, credentials to log in remotely. And so we would tightly secure the, the uh, ingress point of the data center with firewalls, right? Where's Shannon? We're going to still keep hunting for that father of the firewall. Um, and you know you want to protect something like a database, the, the, that was static, right? The database would sit there, it'd have a static IP address. You might create a firewall rule that says app server with this IP can access a data server, uh, database server with this IP in this port. Does anyone have the spreadsheet? I like to call it the spreadsheet. It's a giant spreadsheet full of, you know what I'm talking about, right? ports and IPs, and, and they map firewall rules. Maybe it's a CMDB, but the idea is the same, right? Huge database of who can talk to what. Um, the problem is all this stuff is hard-coded. That works OK if things don't change very often. But that traditional security model sort of falls apart as we move into dynamic environments like the cloud. We have things like shared service accounts. Um, people using the same username and password, or entire teams using the same service account, right? Or a whole bunch of machines that have the same username and password on them. They're hard to rotate, hard to decommission. Uh, revoking compromised credentials could unknowingly break things. So who knew that Fred's credentials were hard-coded into the production config file? Oops. Fred's gone, right? He put those there two years ago, and no one knew about it. So this security posture does not work well in dynamic environments that change a lot. So we looked at the castle and moat traditional model. Here's the modern model. Feels kind of weird, right? That doesn't look very modern. 
these, these are tents, they're yurts. Actually, these are Mongolian yurts, or in the local uh, language, they're called gur. Instead of a castle with walls and a drawbridge, a fixed fortress with an inside and an outside, these nomadic people move from place to place, bringing their houses with them. And so the ancestors of these people, over a period of about 90 years, uh, were able to conquer almost all of Asia, parts of the Middle East and Southern Europe. I like to read history. So read about the Mongolian Empire. It was the largest contiguous land empire in human history. So how is it even possible for a bunch of nomadic warriors living in tents to pull this off? Well, the Mongolian Empire employed some very dynamic tactics. Um, every time they would conquer an enemy, they'd take all of their scientists and engineers and generals and bring them into the fold and learn everything they knew. And each warrior uh, would be in charge of up to five horses. So it's not just you know, one person on a horse. It's one person with three backup horses. So they can go 100 miles in one day in the year 1200, which is incredible, right? It's kind of amazing, right? And then think about the castle. This is the one that puzzled me the most. Like, how, how would you break into a castle? They had siege engines and catapults. And no, they didn't break them down and pack them up on a cart and pull them behind the horse. They would roll up to the castle and then go cut down a bunch of trees and build the siege engine from what they could find right there in the local area. So the basic idea here is the old way is heavy. It's slow to change. Um, it's kind of you know not very flexible. And the new way is very flexible, dynamic, adaptable, temporary. It's not a perfect analogy, but it might help you explain this to your non-technical friends or maybe your manager. And that brings us to identity-based security. Did anyone fly in from out of town? All right, welcome to Austin. Try the breakfast tacos. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. Um, what was the first thing they asked you for when you went to check into your hotel? Yeah, driver's license and credit card. Can I see some sort of valid ID? Who are you? You have to identify yourself. Vault works in a very similar way. Um, so when you go to the hotel, who are you? You provide an ID, and then they give you a key card that gives you a certain type of access to the hotel. And it's temporary limited access. Usually you can get into your own room, right? Maybe you can go to the gym. It might open the side door in the hotel and maybe the, the concierge will let you into the, you know, the lounge, right? So Vault works the same way. As a human or application, you approach Vault, and there's a, you, kind of hard to see here, but there's several different ways you can authenticate to Vault. Vault says, who are you? Can you please present some ID? And using one of these methods, you identify yourself as a human or an application. Vault looks up what you're allowed to have access to, and it hands you a token. That token is like your hotel key card, okay? It's got an expiration date, and it's got a list of policies that determine what can you do with Vault. So this basic analogy illustrates how Vault works. Vault was designed to address the security needs of modern applications that may have to run on hardware or infrastructure that you don't even own. How do you secure things in a data center that you can't control, right? So we're now running things that are owned by AWS, Google, Microsoft, but we're still expected to keep all of that stuff safe and secure. The solution is to use identity instead of static IPs that we may not be able to rely on. And you can use dynamic short-lived credentials that are generated on demand. Those credentials will tie back to the identity or the person that requested them. That way you can say, well, who, whose key card was this? Oh, that belonged to Joe in room 304, right? Those belong to Sean, and he logged in using his LDAP credentials. And then finally, you can easily invalidate the um, credentials or the hotel key. It's so much nicer than in the old days. You know, if you lost your hotel key, there'd be a big fine. Uh, you know, you'd have to pay a fee. They'd have to rekey the lock. Now it's just a matter of going to the front desk and saying, hey, I lost my key. They ask you for your ID again, right? And say, okay, here, mister, there's a, a new key for you. Now, once you've authenticated to Vault, 
you can access what we call secrets engines. Vault does a lot more than storage, so it can certainly store secrets that you already have. Some of these secrets engines can actually generate dynamic secrets on the fly. We can do this for all of the major clouds and also for Active Directory. Temporary credentials with limited permissions that expire after a certain amount of time. So this can help address some of these you know, vulnerabilities we've heard from the other speakers. It can often sit there for years, lying dormant. You know, an old API was left running. I once saw a, you know, a hack that occurred through some forums that should have been shut down, but they weren't. You know, they just were running. I won't dive too much into Vault's architecture internals. Just know that everything in Vault is encrypted and you control the master key. So you can run Vault on someone else's network that may or may not be secure. The basic security model of Vault is not to trust anything outside of itself. So it puts you in control of your secrets management and your security posture. And these slides are online if you want to go and learn more about any of these topics. One final thing before we get into the, the demo part. Um, Vault is HA. HA is an open source feature. So you can actually spread your Vault um, servers across three zones as we've done here. That way if you lose a data center or a zone, you won't lose access to your secrets. Speaking of secrets, let's talk about dynamic secrets with Vault and how, how, to, how it works. It's pretty simple. We first are going to enable the database secret engine. This is like a plugin for Vault, so you turn that on. Then we configure the secrets engine, create some roles that determine what it's going to do and how it's going to behave, and then you can start using it. We request a new set of credentials. Vault says, OK, here are some credentials. They're good for 30 minutes or an hour. And then you can go ahead and connect to the database or the cloud provider using those credentials. They may be read-only. Maybe you want to give developer read-only access to the cloud. Or they might be limited to one particular region. So you can get very, very specific with what those credentials can do and what they will you know, enable you to access. And now it's time for that live demo. This should be fun because you get to participate in this demo. And let me just switch to mirroring here in my uh, projector so I can see what I'm doing. Did it fake? Yep, there we go. All right. If you want to follow along, go ahead and open this URL. You're going to help me load test our training platform today. <laughs> yeah. Works best on a laptop. If you've got small enough fingers, you might try to do it on your smartphone. I failed. So bookmark this for later, or you can, you can run it right now if you want, if your laptop's open. Can folks in the back see? Is the text big enough? I can make it a little bigger. How's that? You can see? All right. If you can't, you can also open this URL on your own screen and follow along at home. All right. So click the Start button. It takes about 30 seconds to spin up. Um, and this is our training platform. It's called Instruct. Really like it. It's um, very dynamic. And what they're doing in the background now is spinning up an entire AWS account just for me. I feel like a king or an emperor whenever I turn this on. I'm like, wow, look at it. It's so clean. There's nothing in here. So much space. But infrastructure as code is pretty amazing now that you can go all the way to the level of like a, you know, an entire account using code, spin it up in 30 seconds. Very, very dynamic. While we wait, you guys want to hear a dad joke? <laughs> You're stuck, right? <laughs> My kid told me this one. I'm so proud of her. Um, a sheep, a snake, and a drum all fall off a cliff. But um, psst. 
All right, that's my dad joke. All right, now I've got the text so big that the notes are covering the entire page, so I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna make it a little bit smaller so we have a bit of a terminal. Vault is pretty user-friendly. You can do it on the command line. There's a GUI here, and you can also use an API. Right now, it's default settings. Nothing's really enabled except the default secrets engines. Our first step is to enable the AWS secrets engine. Let's do that now. Yep. Secrets. OK. Now we're going to, if you click these, you can sort of copy to your clipboard. See if it's going to work for me. Yep. So we're using 30 minutes as the least time. Any credentials that I generate will expire in about a half hour. And in this demo, we're just using the root token. You wouldn't do this in production. Oh, my caps lock seems to be like going crazy. All right. I'm just going to copy it then. OK. When you first start Vault, you'll get this root token. It's kind of like the master password or the root password. So like I said, this is also our learning platform. Today it's doubling as our demo. But you can go to our. Um, our learning page and play with these yourself, right? So use that link and you can, you can do this demo on your own. So our next step is to configure the secrets engine. There are a few different ways you can configure this one. Today we'll be using the I am user example. So it's gonna make a user account like you're, you're probably familiar with, but it will be temporary. Now you might be wondering, how does Vault talk, Vault itself talk to AWS or my cloud provider, you do need to give it some kind of admin level keys so that it can create other keys. Does that make sense? Right now, I'm just using the root um, credentials, but you don't have to. OK, get ready for a mini panic attack. This is getting recorded, too, but it's OK, because the account will be deleted in like five minutes as they're furiously taking pictures. <laughs> no Bitcoin farms, please. <laughs> OK, and now I've written a policy in which basically says um, these creds can have access to EC2, but nothing else. This alone would have saved some of the pain of that attack that I experienced, because what was the first thing the attacker did? Delete all the admin accounts, right? So these credentials won't be allowed to do that. It's kind of gamified, too. If you get the answer right, you can click check. And All right, let's start generating some dynamic secrets. So this is the no nothing up my sleeve part, if I were wearing sleeves. There's only one user in the account. Or there should be only one. Yeah, we hope. OK. And now fetching new credentials is as simple as a command line, simple API call, dispensable creds at your fingertips. So I could do this all day long. Let's grab that vault token and do one through the GUI as well. Uh, where is it? There it is. OK. In the real world, you'd probably be using like an LDAP account or something else. There's a bunch of different ways you can log in, as you see here. But for demo purposes, we'll use our token. Click AWS. And this might be handy for users who aren't familiar with the command line, but you want to give them an easy way to get credentials for this sort of work. Just click Generate. 
and then they can copy these creds and be on their merry way. Now let's take another look. These are all the uh, dynamic users that I created. They've got a little bit of identifying information. So we know they were created by Vault. Um, the root user created them. And the permissions are that my role policy that I applied earlier. You can also see all the active leases. This is where Vault is keeping track of how long these um, keys are valid. And the final step, revocation. You might not want to wait, or maybe you had a breach, or you had some reason to believe these keys might have been compromised, in which case you might like to be able to revoke those keys. A couple ways you can do that. You can look at all your leases and then go map these back to the one you want to delete, or you can use the shotgun approach and just revoke them all. I think that should work. Yeah, they're gone. And now we're back to one user again. As I mentioned, this isn't just for AWS. You can use this with GCP, with uh, Azure, and also with Active Directory. And almost every major flavor of database supports this type of credentials as well. So that's been our talk. Thank you so much. I went a few minutes over, but go forth and grab a drink.